goodness. What an interest. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. This is the Latino slant. Yes, that was our countdown. How do I sound, my good people? Hello, hello, hello. Let me know right now. Give me a thumbs up. What do you hear? All right. <laughs> nice. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Latino Slant. My name is Polly, and we have a very special stream tonight. We have a very special stream. Um, as you know, or may know by now, Heat 2 has been released. And it is a novel by Michael Mann and Meg Gardner. And as of today, it is the number one bestseller on New York Times list, if you care about that stuff. Um, it just says to me that people are hungry for great stories. So that is one thing. Salud is another one. So we did an unboxing last week, and it got a lot of... Uh, Got a lot of uh, uh, notice. People were liking it. It says to me that people want to know about Heat 2. I saw the movie again twice this past week. It's one of my favorite flicks. But also, too, I'm like, well, let me read some of it. So y'all decided. We're going to read it live. We're reading it live. What time? We're doing it now. So what I'm going to do is I want to read the first 55 pages. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot out of what is almost 500 pages of the novel. But it includes the prologue, it includes part one, and a little bit of part two, right? Out of this whole big book. But it's a great beginning, it's a great start. So what I wanna do is read, obviously, to you guys, but as I read, I won't be able to interact. I'm gonna take breaks at the numbered marks and then interact with the chat so if you do a membership uh chat or super chat or a paypal i'll answer those upon my break sounds good yeah that sounds good all right the unboxing that is on our channel so you can go check that out because i was so excited that i got that i got this i was just like wow and uh let's go to our other hey yeah it's me it's me. So, yeah, uh, we have a, two different cameras going on. But one is really for the mic. So let us begin and add our Kindle to this loveliness. And we're going to start all the way at the beginning. With the prologue. Is that sounds good to you? I'm going into my reader mode, <laughs> if you guys don't mind. Enjoy the reading. Oh, share the link, guys. Let people know that we are here and uh, we'll be here for at least an hour, 70 minutes. I want to thank all the early comers that have come that are here, our members, our subscribers, and our friends. This is Heat 2, 1988 to 2000, a novel by Michael Mann and Meg Gardiner. Prologue. At 11.32 a.m. on Thursday, September 7th, 1995, the Far East National Bank at 444 South Flower Street in Los Angeles was held up by three men. Neil McCulley, Michael Cerrito, and Chris Shahirless. A fourth, Donald Brehan, Bre uh, Donald uh, Bredan, was driving the getaway vehicle. Far East National was a cash distribution hub with large amounts of currency on hand. Bank employees triggered two telco and one cellular alarm, but the signals went nowhere. The night before, Cerrito had cut through the ceiling of the bank's underground garage to access the alarm's CPU on the floor above and change out three of its circuit boards. Twenty minutes before the robbery, the alarm system turned itself and its video recorders off. 
At 11.50 a.m., McCulley, Cerrito, Shahirless were walking out one at a time, carrying duffel bags containing $12.8 million in cash. Wow. So let, let us also, let's also do a little music underneath. We'll make sure it's not loud. I always like hearing that in my ear as well. Okay, let's get back to this. Five minutes earlier at 11.45 a.m., Vincent Hanna of LAPD's Robbery Homicide Division had received a tip about the armed robbery in progress. Hanna, his detectives, and units of, un of uh, uniformed police raced to the bank as McCulley, Cerrito, and Shahirless were crossing the sidewalk on their way out. In the next moments, downtown L.A. erupted into urban warfare. Hannah has been pursuing this crew since he arrived on the scene of a violent armored van robbery. Pulling in, he found the typical crime scene paradigm. The order, the ordered regularity of street furniture, curbs, lampposts, utility boxes, and then the anomalies appeared. Brains, bone shards, irregular pools of blood, the underside of an armored van on its side like a petrified mammoth. The armed robbers' identities were a mystery. But what Hannah knew at first glance was that they were a heavy-duty crew of high-line pros. There were signs, like discarded shards, leavings, that contained messages about what happened. Reversing how they got there told Hannah the sequence of events and about the crew's methods. The spot they had picked was good escape routes, on-ramps to two freeways, they ignored loose cash, and the two-minute elapsed time of robbery meant they knew how long it took LAPD to respond to a 2-1-1. The skillful use of shape charges to cut the precise rectangular opening in the armored plate told Hannah this crew could go in on the prowl. They could do sophisticated high-line burglaries as well. That meant they were capable of taking down a variety of scores any way those scores needed to be taken down. And if they went in strong, they'd rock and roll at the drop of a hat. They killed two armored guards when one reached for an ankle holstered handgun. They executed the third off a cold calculation. Since it had become a murder one beef anyway, why leave a living witness? If, if you happened into this crew's way, then that was going to be your problem. Hannah finished taking in all taking it out all in before speaking to the detectives technicians and uniformed officers from other divisions robbery homicide division was LAPD's elite major crime unit its purview was citywide Hannah had the authority to appropriate any case in any division he wanted this one RHD took over working his networks of informants Hannah identified one crew member Michael Cerrito Surveillance on him led Hannah to the others, except the elusive McCulley. Hannah knew, as for conclusion, given this crew's proficiency, they were unlikely to leave behind enough physical evidence at a crime scene to tie them to it. So Hannah's strategy became to surveil them, discover what they were talk taking next, and where and be there when they walked in the door. Neil McCulley became aware that somebody was on them. When it happened, his reaction was calm and smooth because smooth was fast. Fast wasn't fast. Shahirless was inside a precious metal depository, cutting a hole in a metal vault door with a hollow core drill at three in the morning. Cerrito was on a telephone pole monitoring his alarm system bypasses. Trejo, on lookout, was circling the block. Outside on the sidewalk, the night air was cool on Neil's face as he watched the dark, vacant streets. He heard a sound. It was sheet metal hit by a solid object. It was the sound that should not be there. It came from a row of delivery vans parked across the street in a lot for an industrial bakery. That sound was out of place. They were supposed to be empty. They weren't. Coolly, 
Neil re-entered the building, Shahirless guiding the hollow bit was moments away from accessing the lockbox. After that, it would be open sesame. Neil gave the order. Walk away. They left behind tools, work clothes, six weeks of preparation. That was their discipline. Hannah watched it all played out on the FL, FLIR images. From hidden cameras inside a bakery delivery van, his SWAT teams were staked out and well hidden. He let them go. He wasn't settling for breaking and entering. He wanted them for real. Afterwards, Neil gathered Shahirless, Cerrito, and Treo outside a DWP electrical substation where the exposed high-voltage conductors created so much RF interference that any transmission from bugs they hadn't found on their cars would be scrambled. They had to decide there and then, split and go their separate ways right now or figure out who the hell cut them in, dump their surveillance and stay and take the bank anyway. For Shahirless, it was automatic. His marriage His marriage was on full tilt. He was solid with a lethal sobriety and pinpoint, pin, pinpoint focus when he was in the groove on the job. They had been scoring month in, month out. It was, it was in normal life that Chris was a fuck-up, a reformed gambling junkie. He fell off the wagon on a Saturday morning two months earlier at Santa Anita. He lost a load on the third race and started betting wildly on meta-coincidences based off numbers and names including a horse named Dominic, the name of his son. It lost too. He blew half of what he and Charlene had stashed after a year and a half of solid scoring. Charlene had had it after that. She wanted, an aversion, she wanted a version of adult light for them and their son. She had pulled herself up out of a downslope life. To her, Chris was staying a child growing older. For Chris, dumping the cops who had cut them, cut into them and taking the bank's 11 to 12 million was worth the risk. Sitting in night shadows beneath soaring ramps off the 105-110 interchange in a Cadillac, Neil was handed a package of counter intel, including Vincent Hanna's personal life by his fixer and middleman, Nate. Nate was an old school SoCal bank robber. He and Macaulay had done time in McNeil Federal Penitentiary in Puget Sound. Now, he was a broker of scores and Neil's fence, tall, skeletal, and careful with stringy long hair. Nate worked out of a blue lit lounge, which he owned in Encino called the Blue Room. Right now, he was searching to find compelling words to frame his urgent caution. This Vincent Hanna in the RHD wasn't on the job to serve and protect. He wasn't a careerist working up the admin ladder. He was on a third marriage because he was out there all night on the prowl. He was one of those dedicated types. He was all over Neil's crew, all except Neil. Neil's mantra was split in 30 seconds flat if you spot the heat around the corner. Nate reminded him of that. And Hannah could make mistakes. Hannah could hit or miss. Neil could not miss once. Neil considered and rejected all of it. He felt no obligation to explain why he'd stay, break his own tenant, evade Hannah, and take the bank anyways. No one needed to know, he told himself initially. Edie was a one-night stand, and he'd make do with the memory. Her life was a million miles away from, from Neil McCauley's. She was a freelance graphic designer. Originally from the Blue Ridge Mountains, working a day job at an architectural bookstore in Santa Monica. With her, a door had opened that Neil didn't think was there anymore. He had been close on a bloody two-lane blacktop outside Mexicali years earlier. He wanted to be with this woman. This score and the life it bought them. Somewhere far away is why he'd stayed. He hadn't planned for this. But a future without her had come to count for zero. At one moment in time after Vincent H Hanna discovered his surveillance of Neil, Neil McCauley was blown, he and Neil came face to face. 
It was because staying covert didn't matter anymore, Hannah realized. He pulled over Macaulay on the 105 freeway. He wanted whatever he could learn about Macaulay, and he could learn more by talking to him face to face than from his blown surveillance. Macaulay, too, knew he might have a split second in the not too distant future to intuitively decide to zig or to zag. So he wanted the sensory intake of who Hannah was. They sat down at Kate Mantellini on Wilshire Boulevard. They both knew blunt faces about the other. Excuse me. They both knew blunt facts about the other, but they were devoid of color. Each man's intake of the other was highly sensitized and raw. They were both predators. Neil knew about Hannah's burnt out marriages. Hannah confessed it was the price paid for chasing guys like him around the block. Neil confessed he had a woman, but he didn't talk about her or what he had said to her one night. My life's a needle starting at zero and going the other way. A double blank. That was until she came into it. He convinced Edie to leave with him. While revealing nothing might compromise themselves, they talked with the intimacy sometimes occurring between strangers. They discovered that they took in the real world and that the way life rushed at them in similar ways. Hannah was haunted by dreams dead bodies on a long table looking at him. They didn't say anything. They looked imposed obligations. Macaulay didn't acknowledge obligations. He had dreams he couldn't breathe. He was drowning. May <clears throat> Maybe he was running out of time, Hannah offered. They were in the same they were the same in that they both knew life was short. We are footprints on a beach until the tide comes in and each navigated the future racing at him with eyes wide open, raw, polar opposites in some ways. They were the same and taken in how the world worked, devoid of illusions and self-deception. At the same time, each would blow the other out of his socks with no hesitation. They knew that too, but that might never happen. They might never even see each other again. And that's how the meeting ended. All right, let's take a quick little break. How's everyone doing? Wow. What do you guys think of this? Are you guys enjoying this? Let me get a little drink. We're in the we're we're almost done with the prologue. So Really, guys. Here, let me um switch a camera. Really what the prologue is telling us is the movie right and um kind of going over the with uh with uh with the brush strokes um of the movie but giving a little bit of insight that only a novel can give which is wonderful and it's from michael mann and his author and his writer so you know you know it's it, you know it's great um and there's little clues there as to what's going to be in, 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 in the, in the, uh, when we start getting into the new story. Um, so let's go ahead and say hello to some people. Stump Brat loving this good retelling of the film so far. So good. Oh, hell yeah. Hail Phil. Oh, Phil's here. Hey buddy. Um, um I also want to say that I got two versions of this, right? I got this for myself, my, my hardback. Okay. And then I, I, I bought the Kindle just for you guys so I can read this properly. Cause I was trying to figure out how to set this up and have a camera on it. And it just wasn't working out. It just wasn't looking good. It has to look good for you guys. So I also purchased the Kindle version of this. Pretty cool. I love it. All right, let me see if I did I miss any if you guys feel a feel a um oblig you know not obligated but if you feel uh, feel like it you can pay, pay PayPal the uh, channel and all that good stuff. Please share the link, let people know that we're here. And uh let's continue our journey together, guys. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to kill one camera. There you go. Do, let me uh, do this and let's get a little more music up. 
I always like music in my ear. There we go. Okay. Let us continue. Heat 2. We're still in the prologue. They just finished meeting. In the chaos of the Far East bank robbery, Bree Dan was killed at the wheel of the Lincoln by Hannah's detectives Drucker and Casuals. Cerrito, shielding himself with a five-year-old, was shot through the head by Hannah. Hannah's partner, Bosco, was gunned down by Shahirless. Three uniformed LAPD were dead and 11 wounded. Three seriously. Shahirless was hit above his body armor by a 556 millimeter round traveling at 3100 feet per second it slammed into it slammed him to the ground and shattered his clavicle sending bone shrapnel throughout his upper thorax neil half carried him into a supermarket parking lot where he carjacked a station wagon they had to get the hell out of la neil never made it hannah killed him under the approaching lights at the foot of an lax runway Edie was waiting for him in a Camaro on the driveway next to the airport marquee hotel on Century Boulevard. Only Chris Shahirless survived. Nice. Very nice. Well, you know, I almost should have, I didn't realize I was like so close to the, uh, to the end there as far as uh, the prologue. <laughs> but that's all right. That's totally cool. Again, we're here, guys. Late night, Latino, Lant. We have the book of Heat 2. And no, I'm in no way getting paid to promote this. Getting paid. <laughs> I am a pure fan of Michael Mann, his movies. And I've been looking forward to this new story from him. And May Gardner, this book is now a number one New York Times bestseller which is fantastic. We have some other people here. I want to say hello to you guys. Visinger is here. Que paso? Good to see you. And Wex Wuta. Story time with Theo Polly. That's right. Yeah. And Matthew Rydell is here. I don't know. Um, Matthew, I haven't seen Matthew in our slant uh, chats. Welcome, my friend. Welcome. Welcome. This is a special stream today, tonight, today, and all that stuff. Whenever you... Uh, Guys, check this out. Okay. I think we're ready for part one. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let's do this, guys. Um, Yeah. I'll change the camera after part one, after uh, we get through this. Okay, here we go. Part one, Los Angeles, 1995. And this is a quote. Realness eats raw meat and does not waver. He has the staying power of the sun. He walks only in his own shoes. Spoon Jackson. One. Night strobes between slats of blinds, intermittent pink and blue neon from the Korean corner mall outside. Headlights from turning cars cast shadows on the ceiling. Music pounds up through the floor from a music store below. It drums like a pulse through Chris Shahirless's shoulder and neck. Get up. And he can't get there. Get the fuck up. Now. Shahirless opens his eyes. He isn't dead. The dead don't throb from K-pop coming up through the floor. The dead don't bleed. He isn't home. Home is a ranch house homogenized into the anonymity of the San Fernando Valley. This is a mattress on a frame in a corner. It isn't a jail cell. Upstairs apartment, Koreatown. His eyes sink shut, riding the oxycodone tide once more. Then he crests awake. How am I here? K-pop washes like staccato gunfire, a memory, the swinging weight of the duffel of money slung across his back on its strap. Breedad hit. Dead meat at the wheel. Ambushed. 
more LAPD incoming. Cops, superior firepower used to overwhelming civilians. Civilians? Overwhelm this motherfucker. Black and white sheet metal turning into sieves. The sound drives your pulse into your head, exploding out the top of your skull. Music thuds, bright and foreign. Use it. Focus eyes, he mutters. Shadows and pink light from the street strip and the grimy walls. Bed, cheap sheets, him in his boxers. His clothes folded on a plastic lawn chair, a darkened TV on a card table. Old cigarette butts stubbed out on a, on a chipped saucer. Beer cans crushed in a wastebasket. Voices outside. The wound track screams. Bone fragments didn't lacerate his subclavian artery. If they did, he'd be dead. Chris kicks for surface. Get the fuck up! He tries to roll over and sit up. He slammed back by his shoulder and neck muscles, screaming. How did he get here? Horns honked at him, startling him out of his stupor at a red light turned green. He remembers slow driving across lanes northbound over the dark Sepulveda Pass back to Nate's in Encino after he left Venice. He didn't trust himself on the 405. Venice. Her hand glided through the air in a blackjack dealer gesture. Drawing cards is over. She called and left word. Nate argued. He left anyways, drove to Venice. He winced himself out of the car, spotted her waiting on the balcony. Her eyes, a smile, inviting, like when they first met. When the rising of that look, overtaking her, warning him. The Koreatown door opens. Nate walks in. He's tall in a blue button cream sports coat and bolo tie. Stringy blonde hair, greased back, 70s mustache, drooped down his blotchy face. His eyes, quick and small, looks are hearless up and down, quietly evaluating. Time is it? Nate closes the blinds. What? How long have I been here? Words. He hears them in his head. They make sense. And are they coming out? Nate leans over him. Hold still. He drags the lawn chair beside the bed, sits down, and cautiously peels back the medical tape on the gauze dressing that covers the gunshot wound. The small 5.56 millimeter round at high velocity had punched him into had punched into him like a sidewinder missile, fulfilling its design. Large cap captivation, excuse me, large cavitation through through body mass. Bone turned into shrapnel. Chris remembers being on his back on the asphalt in adrenalized clarity. View si askew side views of car of police cars they'd shot to pieces. Can't move. Neil hauled him up. Nate pulls off the dressing. The sutures are black. The skin red and hot. The overhead light silhouettes. Nate grunts, nods, and presses the tape back against Chris's skin. He leans on his elbows. He searches Chris's eyes. You were here with me. Are you in Disneyland? His voice is low and hoarse. Chris nods. You gotta get out of here. Fast. Nate moves shit. Merch. Him. Scores. Anything. Charlene. Chris rasps. You got a couple hours and that's it. His son. His wife. Charlene isn't here. Neil? Chris asks. Nate's eyes go cold, expressionless, a controlled response from a veteran of bad outcomes. You stay here, you're dead meat, Nate says simply. That's all you gotta think about. Neil, get your shit together, I'll be right back. Nate hesitates, shakes his head in a, in a mill millimeter, then heads for the door. Chris sees him, stripped pink and blue from the neon across the street. He tries to send his voice across the room to Nate. Before he goes over, the boombox beat of K-pop through the floor, don't shake your head, man. Walk away. The door shuts. All right. Ooh, I'm liking this. All right, my good people. So, uh, what are we thinking? Are we liking this? <laughs> que pasa? Que piensas? Let me see here. Oh, I know what we can do. 
get this a little big. Ooh, it's like really big. Okay, so we're on part one. Uh, thanks for the shout out, Polly. Great channel and show. Keep it up. Thank you, Matthew Rydell. Hey, pop makes anybody come back from the dead only for a little bit. <laughs> Ray J, I know, I know. That's crazy, man. Um, I'm so happy you guys are here on a late night uh, on the Latino slant. I hope that uh, my reading can, uh, whatever you guys are doing, maybe you guys are kicking back, hanging out, uh, put the speakers up and uh, listen to the story. Stump Brand is here. She's enjoying it. Polly. Nice. Yeah, it was nice. It's fun. We're having a good time. We're having a good time. Um, so, yeah. Already, I love, and I've read this before. I've read this first part, this first part a couple times already. And I, I practice for you guys, too, so I can, you know, kind of just grip the language a little better. I obviously like the way it's starting off and, uh, you know, this this chaotic time where Chris is pretty much high and in pain and then Nate comes in and of course we're thinking of the old characters right we're thinking of the old actors you know Val Kilmer and John Voight in these which is even cooler because we have frame of reference so again the book is E2 there it is and you guys got the Kindle all right what do you guys think so far? Are you guys liking the way it... Uh, I'm going to keep going. Oh, yeah. I am going to keep going. I'm taking I'm taking mini breaks. Mini breaks, guys. Okay. Um... <laughs> John Voight's Nate and Val Kimmer hiding in K-pop Central. LOL. Right? Hey, you know, at that time... In 95, I mean, Koreatown was not the cool hip place it is now as far as like, you know, hipsters and all that stuff going to Koreatown or even living there now. Um, it was a lot more segregated and uh, there was definitely, definitely a lot of space where you can disappear in K-Town. So, but uh, yeah, I, lo I just love these characters and it's great to see them come alive. All right, well, let me get one more sip. And again, welcome to the Latino Slant. Make sure you are subscribed. Make sure you're getting the alerts. I've been getting more than one of you guys complaining to me that you missed the live stream or you missed this because YouTube is not alerting you guys. And uh, that's a real thing. And that's not cool. So just, just double checking all your good stuff there. That would be great. All right, my good friends, let's pick it up, shall we? All right, let's get a good frame for you guys. Two. Vincent Hanna paces besides the, pa the plate glass, scanning the room. Surf outside beats a drum, a, a drum roll against the sand. The ocean is dark cobalt. The tops of low cumuli catch threaded gold like braid on a dressed uniform. Sunrise, 6 a.m. The house is empty. Neil McCauley lived here, but he's not coming back. Hannah's here because he wants this place to tell him things. He wants Macaulay to speak to him again. It hasn't been six hours since he fired the three rounds that took Macaulay down. He took Macaulay's hand through the paroxysms that carried him into death. They understood each other as if they were the only two people on the planet. Alone, isolated, within who they were. But only they knew how it all really works tactile memory is still in his left arm. He crosses Neil's li living space looking. The time he has left his the time he has left is evaporating. He wants something, info, data points. The hardwood floors produce only echoes as he crosses. The crash of breakers. 
the sound off the windows. The glass railing on the balcony is stained with white seagull shit. Macaulay doesn't live here. In this white space, he slept here, ate here, drank the single malt from the one bottle on the counter. Macaulay never inhabited the place. It has. It had been. It had to. It had to been a way station. No attachments. Walk it. Walk away in thirty seconds flat from anything, and anybody if you spot the heat around the corner. He told Hannah that. So. Who is that girl in the Camaro? Outside, the rising sun opens the sky above the dark ocean. Anna turns from the windows. Everything's gone. Macaulay's cut of an eight-figure bank score. Cerritos, Cerrito, Trejo, Bredan, except the last man, Chris Shahirless. He's out there. Where? Sergeant Jamal Drucker sweeps into the living room from the back of the house. He moves like a carbon blade. Quiet, sharp. His brown face, grave from the dim light. Grave in the dim light. Nothing's here, Vincent. Straps, specks, scintillas. He thought his thoughts streamed in ta- into tangents. Someone from Michael Bosco's family will be at the morgue by now. This he dreads. There, or the funeral home. That indifferent look on Shahirless's face as he fired, no hesitation. The three-round burst killing Bosco. Where's Shahirless? Hannah's chances of closing in on him are running out, even in evenly metered units like a tactometer in reverse. With time's unusual indifference, it's ripping away at his possibilities. Drucker looks tired, but his deep voice is channeled. Focus. Three identical white shirts in the closet. Books, mechanical, metallurgy, Cam- uh, Camus, Marcus Aurelius. Don't ask me why. Why doesn't that surprise him? No women's things, lipstick, mascara, lingerie, tampax, rubber gloves, and pink or turquoise on the drain pipe under the sink. What's in the fridge? Yogurt, raspberries, frozen Twinkies, somethings besides TV dinners? One bottle of vodka. But Macaulay had a woman. But Macaulay had a woman. She had a stricken look on her face beneath a tumble of brown hair. Standing at the side of the Camaro, she's in the low-res hotel security footage. Shoulders crumpled, crumpling as Macaulay turns away from her and runs. Hannah in pursuit. The tags in the Camaro didn't match. No question it was Macaulay's ride. Who is she? Hannah looks at Drucker. She was taken off with him. Who? The girl in the Camaro. But maybe she's gone. From her look, she's not a player. So where would she go without her? Maybe she knows who was laying out in Neil's transpo. Whoever that is, is who Shahirless is using. He's not doing curbside check-in at LAX. Shahirless no-showed because... He, because he clocked, we were on Charlene. He knows Charlene's not going anywhere. That means he's on the run, alone. Whoever set up Macaulay's transpo is the guy he will go to. He turns, scanning. Anything in this, in this bullshit, sterile, white with seagull shit on the window place tells us who the fuck that might be? He studies the, ro- the living room, now lit blue in the, in the growing dawn. His pulse feels heavy. He tries to soak up information, but this house holds nothing but reflections. Who can tell me this? Nothing. Why am I still here? He's trying to feel Neil's presence, standing where Neil stood, seeing what he saw. A certain melancholy holds him to the hardwood floor, a life gone, irreversible, a man he knew. They knew how the other thought about personal things in that moment as they sat across from each other at Kate Mantellini. At the time, Hannah learned nothing he could to put logical use about the man. Drucker moves into their kitchen. Antiseptic, gleaming appliances, a spotless counter. A pen besides yesterday's LA Times, he unfolds the the newspaper to look for scribbled notes, phone numbers, names, initials, flight information. Beneath it is a glossy book. Vincent, Drucker says. Stress fractures in titanium. Anna approaches. Drucker hands in the book. Great reading list. Cold, clinical shit. 
price tag is stuck to the back. Tennessee and Ingalls. You know that place? Santa Monica. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's an art and architectural bookstore. And it flips through the heavy stock pages. A receipt is stuck inside. Bought the book last month. Paid in cash. The world of surfs seeps throughout the windows. Through the windows. Hannah holds up the receipt. Drucker's already dialing. Haul the manager's ass in right now. Neil was in that store three weeks ago buying this. Who was with him? Who waited on him? Who cashed him out? Drucker heads out the door. Hannah stands there in front of the ocean. The night before airliners roared overhead, he felt Neil's hand rushing pulse in his left hand. He felt Neil McCauley's rushing pulse in his left hand. Now Hannah hears only the surf. His right hand touches the glass. Neil, maybe Chris, maybe Chris too, stood here, right here like this. Where am I? Looking through this glass. He tries to channel Neil's thinking, alone in the vastness, except for this body, this organism, perceiving until it isn't. That's what Neil would think. Hannah held Neil's hand as paroxysms racked his body. Shock from hemor hemorrhagic arteries. If he had to, he'd do exactly the same again. And that changes nothing about this moment. Both are true. He turns from the sea. He wraps his knuckles against the glass as he walks away. The sound drums in the twilight like a prayer wheel. Oh, right. End of part two there. Oh, man. Very nice. Yeah, man. Polly here at the Latino Slant. We're doing the Heat 2 novel reading. Just the first 55 pages, guys. That's all it is. And here's the book right here. Let me just make me a little bigger. So, yeah. Going through the first 55 pages. And again, I was like, how can I show the show this and you guys? I, I just couldn't get that right angle. So we went with the um, with the Kindle. So let me uh, check in with the chat as we take a little break. Uh, and this is what I was talking about uh, as far as notifications. Our own, one of our own members of the channel just got the notification. Okay, restart from the beginning. Do it, brother. Do it, brother. Because me and Brian have been talking about this for a while here. Um, Stump Brass talking about some uh, some cool Hollywood stuff. My stunt mentor, Walter Robles, was roommates with John Voight in the early 60s. They both parked cars on Sunset to pay the bills. Wow. I guess this was before um, Midnight Cowboy. Uh, I got to go with Walter. I got to go with Walter on the set. Runaway train? Dude. Wow. That is some memory. That is some memory. All right. Well, uh, you know, I hope you guys are are, are really enjoying this special sh this special stream. I am out of coffee, but I'm pretty... Uh, I got plenty of water. Why don't we change the music a little bit and we'll go with the endless tensions you guys heard the heard this in the uh, pre-show share the link let people know you're there it's out on twitter people are now uh you know retweeting it thank you phil thank you pablo matthew pat s i appreciate you all mm. so are we liking the book what, what, what's uh, what, what are we thinking so far? Are we are we into this? Is this something you buy? Do you guys read novels? Wednesday looks great too. You talking about Wednesday Adams? Yeah. Yeah, I like the trailer a lot. S Beam. Hello all. Hello. Welcome. We've got plenty more to read, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, you want to read this? Yeah. Well, here it is, baby. I got a hardback. I pre-ordered this last January. So you know 
I've been waiting for this baby. And it's only fitting that we do this um, this this live reading. It's just so much fun. Um, let me double check, make sure everything's everything. Great. And Pat S, when you have to leave, maybe um, deleted scenes can watch the uh, the uh, the, uh, the chat for us. All right, let me make sure. Let me just lower it a little bit. Yeah, I like hearing in my ear because it almost gives me a good timing when I'm reading to hear a beat. But I don't want it to like be too loud. Because of the side of it. That's not good. <laughs> okay. He too, the film will be. Oh, man. Ooh, Carmac. Nice. Nice. That I read him years ago. Good. He's very, real desolate shit. <laughs> Um, okay, let's get back into this. And, uh, this time, I think we'll go nice and small here. We're going to kill one camera. Thank you, deleted. Much love. Ah, voila. Three, two, one, three. Nate leans against the hood of the payphone. Receiver to his ear. You know what? That's like actually a little too loud. Let me just lower that puppy. Perfect. Okay. Three, two, one, three. Nate leans against the hood of the payphone. Receiver to his ear. Watching early morning traffic. Watching pedestrians. Debe ir hoy, absolutamente, he says in Ang Angelino white boy Spanish. Today, Shahirless has to go. Waiting longer isn't an option. He's outside a funky Koreatown drugstore holding a bulging plastic bag full of medical supplies, Gatorade, a disposable razor, and more. Half up front, la mitad antes, mitad después. The rest when he gets the rest when he gets there he listens he watches people eye him as he as they pass on the sidewalk a tall busted out rockabilly white guy with a bolo tie from the 50s a charro the car is at my place in the garage blue room yeah azul he nods a que hora he checks his watch he'll be ready he hangs up checks the street steps back so the cholo approaching him from his left can't cross behind him. Prison habits from the yard die hard. He zigzags across the street and slips through the narrow doorway up the stairs to the studio above the music store and dry and dry cleaner where he stashed Shahirless. Inside, Chris hears the footsteps. He sits up on the edge of the bed, woozy and lightheaded. He has to get up. The meat machine, that ain't me. I'm me, inside of it. Get up, body. Do it. Nate enters. Chris pushes himself to rise. Something torques within his gut. Vegas nerves, nausea. The room spins. Stand up, motherfucker. Daylight is a sheet of heated steel outside the window. The oxy is ebbing. Pain is sharpening its teeth. He needs his clarity, even through... Even, even though that means the stabbing with every breath returns. Nate drops a rustling plastic bag on the bed. You leave today, brother. You got to be able to move soon. Chris is parched, headache throbbing, dehydration, and blood loss. He opens a 28-ounce bottle of Gatorade and drinks half of it. Nate dumps out packs of fresh gauze, antibiotic ointment, and a bottle of prescription pills. Broad spectrum antibiotic. Don't be allergic. Nate gets a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and cotton balls. Take off your shirt. I'm changing your dressing. Chris pulls the shirt off and sits heavily on the edge of the bed. The sound of traffic outside the and the light of the room seem to sw 
seemed to swell and fade, a pulsing, flickering sensation. Chris's tongue feels slow. Charlene, he says. Nate pulls a rustling lawn chair beside the bed, sits and strips the tape and old dressing from his shoulders. The air on Chris's skin feels weirdly alive. He leans forward. Charlene, I heard you the first time. Gotta get her. Really? How do you know where she was? She called and told me. Nate's eyes, Nate, Nate eyes him coldly. What's that tell you? No answer. It's not happening. That copy shot, Nate says, dead. One of Vincent Hanna's teams, plus three others. Every eyeball in, in a uniform is looking for you. Chris' voice strengthens. I gotta get them out. Nate straightens, stops, stops patching the wound. Then I'm cutting loose of you right now, man. You try for that? The only out you got is into a hole in the ground. Chris lurches up. Great pain, pain. Great idea. Pain crashes through him like a gong. Nate waits for him to calm down. The only way for you to get them out is you get out first, then set it up. Chris breathes. How did they get to Charlene? How do I know? Nate gives him a flat look. Shut up in his glare. I warned Neil. He didn't listen. Now you fucking listen to me when I talk to you. How? How did it go so wrong? Chris's mind won't focus. All he sees is Charlene's blackjack dealer wave. Cops everywhere. She risked herself to send up a flare. How did they find out where she was holed up? What's with the shoulder, Nate says. I'm gonna take up tennis. Chris crushes his teeth against the pain. Tries to think. Then it lands. What he didn't want to know but knows. Nate sees that. That's right, he says. Neil's gone. The crew is gone. And Charlene gave him up. There's no way around it. Whose place was that in Venice? And the cops were waiting? Even with Hannah and the robbery homicide division, they took down the score anyways. It was all good, cool, until it went wrong. Did they bust her? Did they? Did she set him up but, but, but change her mind? His stomach abruptly cramps. He hunches. What happened, he says, mostly to himself. He's speaking more clearly now. Nate is deliberately ignoring him, cleaning the stitches on his chest with the peroxide, getting out a pair of medical scissors, cutting lengths of tape and prepping the new dressing. Nate doesn't react. I don't know. I don't know all of it. Chris tries the slow breathing. Nate applies antibiotic gel, places sterile gauze pads over the vet's handiwork and tapes him up. Chris doesn't want to look at Nate. He wants to punch him. He wants to kick a hole through the wall, rip right after he rips his own shoulder off. You ain't moving so fast, so you got to start now. Somebody's coming for you, okay? You lag because you got goofy ideas. They will split and get paid anyway, so they don't have to give you shit. And by and by, I'll try to call, I'll try to set a call. Nate turns. Chris clamps a hand on his on his arm. What happened? That coldness in Nate's eyes, it's how he deals with loss. I warned him. He was clear. He was on his way to LAX. He de de detoured to kill that fucking Wayne Grow and walked himself into a trap. The cop, Hannah, shot him somewhere at the airport. Did he get Wayne Grow? He did. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it, man. So good. So good. Did he get Wayne Grow? That's all that matters. That that rat, that rat, that dirty rat. Uh, what did I say? Gatorade bottles were 16 or 32 ounces, not, not in the 90s, not 28. Oh, really? How do you know this? Uh, how do you, how does Pat S know stuff like that? Let me, let's just look back. He opens a 28 ounce bottle of the great gatorade and drinks half of it i don't know maybe maybe it was so you're saying they got that wrong oh look at you already already the fandom strikes that's not right <laughs> oh we're here the latino slant it's a special stream i hope you guys are enjoying this you guys are uh are great thank you so much <laughs> damn right he did <laughs> Looking shit up, man. 
I love it though. I love it. I love it. You know, that's how you, that's how you do it. Okay. Let's check the YouTube stream. Make sure we're good. We have, uh, members in the house. We have friends in the house and I love it. Please share the link. Let people know we're here. And, uh, we'll continue in a second. Let me get, let me get some water. Ah, uh, um, yeah, it's getting that, that time, right. Of the, of the mid nineties, LA, they got it down. Um, I think that's for me, let me open this up for me. That's what I always loved about heat was the, the landmarks of Los Angeles that it, that, that it had. And in the mid nineties, I remember they shut down lost downtown LA for months because they had to not only shoot, but reshoot and reshoot. That was real. So, um, I think the only thing that they didn't do in heat was show the East side, but in the movie collateral, they did. Hmm. All right. Do good, man. <laughs> why don't we get rid of this one and let's bring this up yeah cool cool baby cool and we're on we're on to part four of heat two the new novel by michael mann and may gardner let's uh Let's hit some new music. Let's check you guys. Great. I ate chili mac earlier. Okay. Well, I will eat after this. <laughs> I ate really early, early on, and now I'll, I know I'll be hungry right after. Polly. Okay. I just made you. And me some fresh eggs in butter, Polish sausage, and toasted blueberry bagels coming down the inter shoot. LOL. Oh, man. You had to tease me with all that? Fried eggs and butter, Polish sausage, and toasted blueberry. What a great meal. Okay. Enjoy this meal as we hit part four, Stump Brad. I'm so happy you're here. Let's get another water. All right. <clears throat> Let me see. Let me make sure that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Four. Hennessy and Ingalls is empty. The manager's shaking. It's 8 a.m. Wilshire. Down from the Third Street Promenade, the area is just waking up. The pedestrian walkway hose down and shining. The store's pale hardwood floor and bookshelves gleam. The manager queues up surveillance video from the sales date. Hannah has Macaulay's book and the sales receipt. The manager rolls through the footage, fast forwarding. Hannah stands behind her, closed arms crossed, chewing gum, rocking side to side, eyes on the screen. She fumbles a switch. She's not used to dealing with the police. Drucker paces behind him. When the clock on the screen approaches the timestamp on the receipt, Hannah stills. There's Macaulay. Gray suit. White shirt, Mr. Anonymous, moving with precision as he browses the engineering section and selects the book Hannah now holds in his hand. Self-contained, focus, alert, Neil flips pages back and forth. The camera angle shows electronic microphotography of various kinds of steel. A woman passes along the aisle behind Macaulay. She casts a glance at him and the book, slowing as she walks by. Neil doesn't give any attention to her. Stop. Hannah says, rewind. The manager backs the tape up and replays it. Hannah points at the screen. Who's that? She frowns up. That's Edie. She works here. Did. Where is she? She quit two days ago. Hannah feels electric. He says one word. Bingo. High cheekbones and wide eyes. Her waves of brown hair could have sprung from a pre-Raphaelette painting. 
Her stride is athletic, her clothing soft. Something about her manner reminds him of a doe approaching a busy road. The woman standing beside the Camaro. Drucker is getting Edie's full name, address, social security, and driver's license numbers. Thanking the manager on the move as he speed dials RHD to pull her jacket while heading for the door. Hannah's already run outside. Five. The house is nestled on a hillside above Sunset Plaza. A tiny place with an enormous view across the sprawling grid of the basin. Blue skies, bright sun. The place has the clean lines of a blank canvas. A beat-to-shit Honda Civic is parked in the driveway. No other vehicles, nothing moving on the street, all the shades down. Hannah leads three detectives and four uniformed cops up the drive. He and Drucker aim for the front door with two uniforms. Casuals and the others slip around the back. Hannah's fingers, the, the ting, Hannah's finger, Hannah's fingers tingle. Uncertainty fills him. Possibility, urgency. He knocks on the door, but they stand to the side. Hannah with his combat commander, point forty-five, and Drucker with a twelve gauge. No answer. He knocks again. Force it. The uniform behind him holds a compact battering ram. Then the door, then the lock turns and the door opens. In the shadowed entryway stands the woman Hannah ran past outside the airport marquee hotel. Hannah grabs her wrists and yanks her outside and stands her, her up against the wall. A uniformed policewoman does a quick weapon search. From inside they hear from casuals, clear! Hannah displays a badge. We have a warrant to search the premises. She stares at him, then Drucker. Am I under arrest? Yes, but what happens next depends on what you do in the next five minutes, Hannah says. She blinks. Her face is chalky, her eyes red, her hair disheveled. She's wearing old track bottoms and an indie band t-shirt. Annie takes Hannah takes her by the arm and leads her inside into the modern kitchen and the living room where a graphic design studio has been cobbled together. Outside plate glass windows, a balcony overlooks the city. Other uniforms stand there, staring through the glasses like vultures in black. Drucker unlocks the balcony door and lets them in. Clear outside, one reports. Her hearless isn't there. No surprise. Hannah hears the tick-tock of seconds running down. He points Edie at a stool by the television. Drucker responds to his radio, pushes the earpiece deeper into his ear ca canal, listens, signs off. Gestures Hannah aside. Hannah turns to turns so Edie can't hear. Drucker whispers to him. Totally clean, no priors. She doesn't even get traffic tickets. Hannah turns back to her. Edie stands with her hands clenched by her side, as if half of her is somewhere else, and she doesn't know where to put her body until Hannah waves her to the stool. He gestures away. The policewoman with her open handcuffs. Do you know what I want? She shakes her head. Everything you know about Neil McCauley and his crew. Don't lie. Don't hold back. If you want to stay out of a cell facing accessory charges, talk to me. She flinches. I don't know who he was. I don't know about a crew. Kind of slaps the TV. This works, right? ABC comes in crystal clear. You saw the footage from the bank robbery downtown. He told me he was a salesman, and you believed him? What? He didn't tell. He didn't tell you what he sold. He said he traveled a lot. He sold and sold metal. That matches what Macaulay told him. But Hannah doesn't give it away. He presses closer into her space. Come on, come on, come on. You saw his photo on the news and you hopped into his car anyways. And you took a ride to the airport marquee hotel where mayhem and murder rained down all around you. Replete with fire trucks, cops, crazy people running around, helicopters, and the whole Mardi Gras. And you thought he was selling metal kitchen cabinets or something? She seems for a moment like someone trapped in a burning building as the walls collapse around her. I didn't know it until last night. And I had to do what he said. She's trying to find the words to explain and she can't. Then near the end, he told me. And then, yes, I went with him anyways. This is who Macaulay wanted at his side as he made a run to freedom. She had upended her world to go with him. She'd been standing in the open door of the Camaro watching Macaulay back away and take off. 
the way she kept staring after him, frozen, confused. Hannah now understands. Bereft, Hannah could read her mourning. Her brief glimpse of a different life, a, a wilder, more urgent passion with this intense man was over. He knows she was innocently involved. Technically, a DA might try to label her an accomplice. She is not. Look, Edie, I can protect you, he says. But you have to give me everything. Right now, who else did Neil have contact with? She gathers herself. Michael, he mentioned a friend named Michael. One of the men shot downtown. Cerrito, Drucker says. She nods. He said, her voice cracked. He said, when it rains, you get wet. Michael knew the riff. She swallowed to Hannah. It's clear she's thinking. So did I. Around her, the detectives loom large, filling the room with an unsettling energy. Punitive, she thinks. Nothing's ever encountered. Nothing she's ever encountered. They search the things evasively, as if it's their unalienable right to induce disorder. It's like everything they touch becomes not hers anymore. She might return to them where they lay, but it won't be the same. Her personal possessions are no longer possess possessory. They're, they, they're, they're being stripped of meaning. No mementos anymore, inanimate objects, a careful array of pastels, rolled Japanese paper, precious in the excellence and care of its manufacturer, now merely a thing as thick fingers of a detective search through the sheets. Hannah brings her back back right now back to it right now look at me Edie hey stay right here mildly dazed she looks back to Hannah really taking him in for the first time he sees it every news report leading with the story that Macaulay was killed in a gunfight at the LAX by a cop he's fighting it not taking that last step though Hannah is standing in front of her then she shudders she's taking an electric shock who else did Macaulay talk about, Hannah says. Shahirless, Chris? No. Her gaze sharpens. I saw you outside the hotel. Trejo, Redan, their wives, girls, kids? No. He was all alone. She shakes her head. You shot him, didn't you? And then you went with him, knowing who he was. He holds poised right in front of her face. She sways and her eyes turn dark and shiny almost inaudibly. She repeats, it rains, you get wet. Hannah doesn't move but lowers her voice. Who else did he have contact with? She scraps her fingers through her hair. She scrapes, excuse me, she scrapes her fingers through her hair. She shrugs. He made a stop on the way to the airport. He met a man at the back of the door of a bar. The arc of Hannah's attention focuses on to a pinpoint. What bar? What man? North Hollywood off Burbank Boulevard. I don't know the address. Brick and corrugated sheet metal. Ivy on the walls. Blues. Something. Casuals gets on the radio. Describe this man, Hannah says. 50, stringy blonde hair, mustache, wearing polyester, all 70s. Han, Hannah's pulse, guns. He nods at his men. Cash has already identified the bar and assigned two units to stake it out from two blocks away. Hannah writes something on the back of his card and hands it to Edie. The policewoman over here is going to take you, is going to handcuff you and take you downtown. We have to book you. Do you have an attorney? She does it. Her ability to process what's happening is floating off into a black pool. Hannah sees it. Call this number. He's a lawyer. He'll get you a bail, a bail bondsman. <clears throat> Anybody else tries to interview you, you're entitled to have your attorney present. Understand? She nods, looks into his eyes directly. She sees why Neil wanted to take her along to freedom. He sees why Neil wanted to take her along to freedom. If you remember anything else that helps me, you call. Don't think, don't blink, you call. Before he starts out, he adds, and yes, I had to shoot him. Their eyes connect again and hold that moment, and hold for that moment. Then her look changes. Now it says, anything else? There's nothing else. Everything is over. 
Woo! <laughs> Very nice. Beautiful. I love it. I love it, man. Wow. <laughs> okay, what do we got? We got we got Darth Play wow, Polly. That reading tutor has really paid off. Yeah, cayete. <laughs> El Ramos, what's up, brother? Welcome to everyone late in joining. Don't forget to share the link. Yes, welcome. Anyone, anyone coming in right now? Okay, so we're well into this first part. What are you guys thinking of this story so far? Of this hunt that Hannah and then of uh of Edie, you know, that 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 uh you know that confrontation of you killed him. She realized it. That was fantastic. Anyways, I hope everyone is doing well. This is a special Latino slant stream of the reading of Heat. Heat 2, as a matter of fact. And here is the book. Again, I did not want to read from the book because I couldn't get that right camera image, which is fine. And I didn't want to kind of like, I didn't want to be bent over like this, you know, like, let me read. That would, you know, I wanted to make it as, you know, dynamic for y'all as possible. So we have this as a showpiece. And then we, we, uh, we got it on Kindle for you guys. Okay, so let's check the YouTube link, the YouTube chat. Stump Brad is here. She's eating. How was your food? Darth Plato. Deleted scenes. El Ramos is here. Brian McCann. Matthew Rydell, thank you all for hanging out. This is the Latino Slant. Ah, man. We're... Yeah, just give me a, a quick thought, guys, on, on, uh, on what you've heard so far. And how is my sound? How is everything coming out? You enjoying this setup? Also, too, we're going to, you know, we're going to stop soon. Would you want to hear the next part, you know, next week, in a week, in two weeks? Let me know what you think. And if you're seeing this on the replay, comment what you think. I would love that. Very nice. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Oh, oh let me, let me, let me talk. Let me tell you guys about a couple things about LA. Kate Mantellini no longer exists. And it's in the film a lot. It's the scene. It's the restaurant where um, De Niro and Pacino are in are in are in the scene together for the first time in film history. That that restaurant sadly no exists. That does not exist. It's always had a lot of charm. I remember going and eating there. Some good food. Some good times. Some good memories. That was on the corner of Wilshire Boulevard. And oh God. <laughs> That was just, I just drove by there to pick up one of, one of our dogs today. Wilshire and, oh God, what is that cross street? I lost it, man. I lost it. I lost the cross street. Maybe Stump Brat can help me out. Ah, oh, I can't believe it. Old age, man. <laughs> it's old age. Now it's, now it's killing me. Okay. Also too, Sunset Plaza is an actual part, a little area uh, of sunset in Hollywood that's kind of like that old school uh, you know uh, Hollywood you know that area of uh, you know whiskey a go-go and the Roxy um, it's a little you know a little bit before that and it, it is to get up to Sunset Plaza that part of Sunset Boulevard if you're on La Cienega driving all the way up you 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 it, it, it hikes up really quickly so, you know, when they say that this small little house had this enormous view, that is correct. That is 100% correct. Um, one last thing about the bookstore that they talk about and the, the, uh, the uh, Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. It has gone through so many drastic changes over the decades. It used to be a retro kind of outdoor walking, um, I would say mid-century, you know, architecture. And it got really run down, really run down. So 
by the 80s it was completely kind of just disheveled and uh taken with with homeless that they had to clean it up for the filming of peewee's big adventure in movie peewee's big adventure um he goes to that toy store to see dotty right and remember he's like locking up his his bike with all the all the all the chain lock that's a that's the old promenade so I think late 80s, mid 90s, they totally re redid it, revamped it. It's like like day and night. And where there used to be no businesses, it's all businesses. So that bookstore being there, I remember that bookstore being there. I don't know if it's still there. I can't imagine that it survived. You know, but that's a real spot in L.A., which, again, that's another thing that I like about uh michael mann and michael mann's work uh uh in heat in collateral and other films where he's in, in la okay you know you know you know wilshire pretty well well i don't know that side street i don't know that street where kate mantellini uh used to be anyways that's a little bit of tidbit let's get back to it and i think we're almost gonna be gonna be done here we're on six and uh well we have a couple more to go okay oh this is it here we go i just found out today la has a koreatown never heard of it before i knew about chinatown well koreatown is um i would say four times bigger than chinatown just as far as like uh the the area covers Koreatown, or we call it K-Town, is huge, man. It's huge, and it's it sprawls from it's just goes it's west of downtown Los Angeles, going towards um, the La Brea Tar Pits, you know. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty big, it's pretty big. Chinatown is it can't grow anymore because of the way it's nestled in between. It's just north of downtown and just south of uh, Dodger Stadium that it's this kind of its distinctive area, which is awesome as well. It's very, Chinatown is more walkable. Koreatown, you got to drive to certain places. Um, but yeah. Okay. We are going to get back into it. That's enough breaks. Let me make sure I didn't miss any. Nope. I did not miss any memberships chats or anything like that okay great and like i said if you'd like to it would help the channel and all our little expenses hit the hit the um paypal link and uh you know whatever you you see fit we really appreciate it guys and if you're watching this on the repeat you can do the same thing or hit that super thanks button anytime that would be great as well this is a Latino slant. My name is Polly. We are reading Heat 2, the novel, and we are now at part six. Okay. We want to do this. We want to do. No, we don't want to do that. Yeah, this is cool. Okay, here we go. Part six. Part six. The sun is beating down when Hannah and Swat crash into the blue room. The bar is a dark neighborhood throwback bar on a faded commercial street. The search warrant came through at 1 p.m. Hannah, his team, and uniforms and SWAT approached from the streets behind. They blocked both ends of the alley with black and whites. They eliminated a surveillance camera. If Shahirlis is here, he'll be armed to his fingertips. Who else may be inside? Hannah in a ballistic vest with a Benelli semi-auto sem semi semi 12 gauge at Port Arms is in is in the precise scrum stacked up with the SWAT unit in the tactile uh excuse me uh stacked up within the SWAT unit in yeah let me do it again uh 
stacked up within the slot unit in the tactical ba ballet. Bodies, bodies, precisely lined feet. He nods to the SWAT team leader who holds up an automatic rifle across his chest. Barrel high. The man raises a hand and counts down on his fingers. Silent entry. He reaches zero, aims at aims his his hand at the door like a hatchet. It goes. The door is unlocked. They're in, and in an instant, they cover the they cover and command the space. A long bar runs along the wall on the left. Mirrors behind it. Bottles glowing in the dim light. A few early drinkers stand at the rail or sit at at wobbly tail tables. Gangster's Paradise thumps from the jukebox. The bartender turns. Hannah shouts with the others, Freeze! Show me your hands! A SWAT officer bellows at customers. Up against the wall! Hands behind your head! A second team moves tactically up the staircase. The bartender steps back and raises his hands overhead. A customer dodges for the front door. When he slams it open, Drucker clotheslines it. Clotheslines it. When he slams it open, Drucker clotheslines him. He and Casuals with a Remington 8 870 enters. Hannah arrows the hall. Hannah, er Hannah, er Hannah arrows tall. Let me start again. Hannah arrows toward the tall guy standing at the bar. Hands in plain view, one holding a coffee cup. He's who Edie had described. Older so SoCal hard case, stringy gate, gr <clears throat> stringy gray blonde hair, still eyes watching Hannah in the mirror. Hands on the bar, Hannah says. The guy complies. He smiles like brute in clean, in dry clean polyester. He eyes Hannah in the mirror with a sub zero gaze. He's frisked. A SWAT team member tosses his keys and wallet on the bar. Hannah flips open the wallet. The same ice blue eyes stare from the driver's license. Hannah reads the name, Nathan. We're going to talk about a mutual friend. And he turns, his face is neutral. I know you? How the fuck do I know if you know me? I know you, and I know one guy you know, Neil, Neil McCauley. Nate's expression is a total blank. Who? Your pal. Does it ring a bell? What kind of bell? Like a ding dong, Avon calling, bat bell, security camera out back? Does it, it does it put you and McCulley together at the rear entrance? What are the odds? Upstairs, one of the SWAT officers calls. Clear. The SWAT team leader comes down the hall. All clear. Chris Shahilis isn't here. So happens the odds are zero, Nate says. And it feels the back, the black scorch of anger. Outside, he smiles, a reaper scythe. Good. Because rewinding and, and erasing uh, evices, evinces what we call con consciousness of guilt. He looks all around, all seeing. Since others here have laid eyes on you and, are, and you're meeting him. Drucker says, why lie? You want to lie? Lie about something maybe we can't prove? Lie about Neil. That lie is a loser. Why lie about that? Nate looks around, surveying his LAPD-occupied bar with disdain. So far, up to now, you're eluding me. Eluding? Hannah shrugs. You're here, Mr. Christopher. I figure you're the, I'd figure you're the middleman slash fixture. Right now, at a minimum, you're looking at an accessory after the fact on the armored van robbery with the three associated homicides and a bank robbery, including the murder of an LAPD sergeant during its commission. One of my partners and three uniformed officers. The killing of Roger Van Zandt, and in addition to that aforementioned, carnage. The killing of an asshole named Wayne Grove. He leans close. By Neil, your pal, who told me in person that he was never going back, and he's not. Nate's cold blue, dye, cold blue eyes, set within the pink blotching of burst capillaries, drift across Hannah, barely registering him. Robbery Homicide Division, RHD. Try your showboat, your showboat act somewhere else. Hannah's cool, like still water. Shahirless is on the run or, or may, may not elude me. You will not. For you, I've gotten a lot of time. Nate glances away skeptically, then looks back at Hannah squarely. If you got cause, arrest me. If not, your presence is discouraging my midday business. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hannah suddenly focuses somewhere, glances behind him. Officers are searching the back office. That could take hours. Hannah, Hannah nods Drucker's side. Hannah, wasted time. Hannah says, Scott of voice. Scott uh, Soto Voce. Wasted time, Hannah says, Soto Voce. This guy's like talking to last week's roadkill. What's the play, Drucker says. Him? Call him in. Old school, ex-con. Assign someone young to wear him down. They won't get to first base. Christian Earless considers it. Casuals hit Earless above the vest. Laughable. He's too fucked up to risk commercial air travel. Maybe not enough time for Mr. Fix-It over there to lay on a private plane, flight, uh, file flight pan, plans, uh, look legit, all that. Your hairless is running, but he's on the ground. Bolo's out to every agency in California, Drucker says. Driver's license photo and mugshot. Hannah thinks about it. He won't look the same. He eyes the alley through the rear door, tapping his hand against his legs. He'll get rid of the surfer dude ponytail. Cut his short hair, maybe dye it dark. Get our artist to put together a sketch. New Bolo. If he's got no time, Drucker says he's heading for Mexico. And he ain't backpacking through the desert, Hannah says. Hit the border crossings, send the new sketch and Bolo to customs. Border Patrol, Mexican Immigration, and Baja, Sonora, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo Mexico, Nuevo Leon, Tamaulipas, uh, Judasales. I want every goddamn border crossing from San Diego to Brownsville, wallpapered with his picture. A SWAT officer comes in the back door from the alley, Lieutenant, and it turns. The man jerks a thumbnail, a thumb, <laughs> the man jerks a thumb over his shoulder. There's a detached garage out here. You want to see this? Hannah follows him to the alley, rounds the corner. The door of the garage is rolled up. Hannah stops staring in a fresh oil stain, not yet soaked into the concrete. Someone left recently. Nice. <laughs> nice. Beautiful stuff. Ooh. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I got this is one last part. We're almost to uh, our, uh, our this is, I think, believe our final chapter for tonight. It's good because I can already feel uh, my my mouth, my throat, even though I'm drinking water, it's just getting dry. You know, that's why I'm like, you know, kind of like double clutching there with some of the words. Uh, but let's say hi to you guys. 10 people live in the chat. I hope everyone is doing. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm enjoying it. This is like, I've been secretly today, and now it's not a secret, nervous and excited to, to read this to you guys. You know, it's like an honor. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm having a great time, guys. I'm having a fantastic time. And I, I thank you again. Okay, let's see who's here. Canadian Spider-Man is here. Hey, nice hat, Polly. Beautiful reading, my friend. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm glad you're kicking back with us and letting the words, you know, play out in your imagination. Okay, we've got some conversation going on between Sexy Read, Awesome One says. Thank you, Awesome One. Muchísimas gracias. I think we're ready for the last chapter. And I'm having a blast. Um, let's uh, let's 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 uh, let's do it with some endless tension. All the music we've been playing tonight, including the music you've heard, uh, was provided was his original music by James Esparza, and his credits and his links are in the video description. Much love to James Esparza for making uh, the Latino slant that much cooler. Was Mexican Iron Man here tonight? He was not. I cannot imagine because we started, it was midnight already in South Carolina. But I'm sure he's going to watch uh, the replay. So hail to my brother, Mexican Iron Man. Mike is backstage by the back door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Polly, uh, I love this. 
Thank you, Stump Brat. Thank you, Stump Brat. Lots of awesome people in the chat. Muchísimas gracias. And uh, yeah, let's get another banner. Get our official merchandise page up there. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right. Ooh. And yes, that is a Latino slant mug. You know, right on time. Your official Latino slant merchandise store. The Latino slant.com. Get fun mugs like this. If you're if hey, oh you know what? We gotta get um we have a lot of members here. Members, um, you guys get Get discounts, so you gotta get your discount codes from me. So if you haven't gotten a discount code from me, you have to uh, get a hold of me. Twitter, email, um, the deleted scenes, uh, or whoever's modding, can you put in our email for our members? Latinoslant at gmail.com. Latinoslant at gmail.com. Is the mug microwavable? Yes. sure is it sure is my friend uh i'm gonna play fortnite right now okay well we got one more chapter left if you want to stick around monkey i'd love that let's get to it yeah man and let's lower that music definitely too loud while i read Welcome back to uh, the Latino Slam. Hope you're enjoying this. We are on part seven, chapter seven, I guess, for our reading purposes of Heat 2, 1989 to 2002. We're still, the timeline is still 1995, the day after the uh, the death of Neil McCauley by the hands of Vincent Hanna. And Chris Shahirlis is trying to get out of town. Seven. The road bleeds by the freeway as the car rolls east across the desert. The radio blares. Tall jocks and mariachis at a tecate slowly fade to static. This afternoon is a blur of white sun and pain. Interstate 8. Chris knows the road. He doesn't know the woman who's driving. Los Angeles is behind him. All that remains is a, an oil stain from the car on the floor of Nate's empty garage. The pain is here. The pain is back. Here on the road he's exposed. He can't deaden himself with Percocet. He opens his eyes and bears another second of agony as his neck and back muscles anchored to the clavicle pull on the broken but reset bones. His stitches are large and crude world-class job dr bob a friend drags you to a vet you get vet quality trauma work vacancy washes up through him a cold bitter splash his unthinking take of the world has neil still in it until he remains until he reminds himself in koreatown when nate turned that flat gaze in his direction and told him a hiss had risen in his mind like a road flare. Nate had sat down and leaned close. Somebody will come get you. Next person who comes here will be your out. They'll have your paper. Don't worry. It'll stand up. Where? Chris said numbly. Where I'm going? South. Nate laid out a route. Chris's head swam. My cut from the bank score. We'll be safe. I'll set, set up an account through a Delaware trust. You can access it by phone, fax, computer. But where you're going, don't draw on that money unless it's an emergency. No flash. You can't stick out. I need to get, I need to get some of it off to Charlene and Dominic. Charlene. Luring him into a trap. Why? A black heat ran through him. Did they threaten to take Dominic from her, these fucking people? Nate looked thoughtful. I'll handle that, but I can't get her anything except cash. Nothing that creates a trail and not for a while. 
he stood. I'm going. Chris struggled to his feet, shook Nate's hand. Thanks. You got it. Nate lifted his chin. A farewell. Jumping Jack Flash. Keep your head up. That someone who had come for him is behind the wheel. She wears jeans, Reeboks, and four-inch gold hoop earrings and has a tattoo on her forearm of her grandbaby. She can't be 40. She looks like she could bench press a, a Chrysler. He watches her drive. She's been driving for hours. What's your name? She cuts a glance and may be surprised he's half coherent. Don't matter. You know mine, he says. Jeffrey Bergman, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Her voice is East LA at the safe house. She took his Beretta and demanded he hand over his wallet, both of which he did grudgingly. She redressed the wound and gave him a preppy t-shirt and sports coat, her dark sunglasses to cover the drug glaze in his blue eyes. She dumped him in the passenger seat of the Chevy, of the Chevy and hit the road while he drifted from the syrup sweet stupor into screaming pain. What you need to know is my family worked with Nate from way back and I do the job I'm paid for, she says. You don't trust me? I'll let you out here. You can fucking hitchhike. He tries to raise both hands, a mollifying gesture. His left arm shrieks and his vision goes electric light. He gasps, leans against the wall. Keep driving, he says. She nods at the glove compartment. Envelope's in there. Has your Canadian passport, new wallet with the driver's license, credit cards, family photos, American and Canadian dollars with some pesos. He gets the envelope and slides the passport and wallet into his pockets. Exhaling, he turns to her. How do you do? I'm Jeffrey fucking Bergman. Her lips purse. Maybe a smile. Free to fucking calo. Now, deep into the bright afternoon, she pulls off a pulls off at a gas station. Nate told me to call and check in. No sweat. Just hold tight. She gets out and walks towards a payphone. Chris heads for the john. Feeling his head zoom and trying to walk straight, he washes his face in lukewarm water. In the grimy mirror, he looks like a vampire. Pale. Lips nearly blue. His eyes too hot. Get your shit together. When he comes out, Frida is hanging up the phone. Her face is smooth, but her eyes are jumping. What? LAPD raided Nate's bar. He didn't give them nothing, but they don't need nothing from him. They're not stupid. What else? Is there something? They're adding a new police drawing to the bolo, she said. She shoots him a glance. Sketch of you, close to the way you look now. They'll send it to both sides of the border. We got a roll. She accelerates through skillet, flat farmland past trailer parks, cheap mini marks, scrub and sand. The border skates along a few miles to the right. The freeway has been repaved and more houses, suburban cookie cutter homes line the road. Then there were an 88. Mexicali, he says. Easy crossing, Frida says. You been? Forget it. You think there's a problem? She, she eyes him. Reason you don't want to stay there? Don't worry, we aren't. Then why cross there? Airstrip our south, stay cool. He shuts his eyes and turns his head, but the memory seeps into him. A derelict Chinese style will tell the score that rush, man. Then, then he smells, he seems to smell mesquite and gunpowder and blood. How could, how things could spin, could be lost, could be won in a finger snap. If Chris ever lost Charlene, he'd annihilate whoever took her from him. He'd vaporize him like an H-bomb. Sunlight flashes off the hood it shoots through the through his skull like lightning. Neil's home free. Neil had had said. Neil also took him. Hannah's a motherfucker, and right now Hannah's prowling the city, mobilizing every asset he can. One thought: you, you killed his partner. Now Chris is alone, far from home. Only one way to change that: keep going. Last chance. Don't throw it away. A mile out of El Centro, Frida Kahlo leaves the interstate and pulls over. The afternoon is lengthening, shadows falling across the fields. She puts the car in park. Take off your sunglasses. Let me see your eyes. She pulls them off and gives him a stare. Straight enough? Yeah. You drive us across. Why? She gets out. Saying I'm your auntie if they look or, if, or the nanny if that makes you feel better.
He doesn't actually mind the edge in her voice. He gets behind the wheel, dabbing sweat from his face with his sleeve. He carefully pulls back onto the road. His pulse is jacking. It pounds through the shoulder wound like a hammer. Five miles south of I-8 in Calexico, they approach the border checkpoint. Four cars are in line ahead of them. Easy crossing, sure. Nobody at the American checkpoint cares if you leave the United States, not unless you're a drug, drug trafficker or a felon or wanted in L.A. for taking down the cop. Chris slows and gets in line. The day is cooling. Sunset will be coming, coming on soon. As agents stand at the head of the line chewing, gum lacks days ago but there's a booth lit a garden side flyers and posters on the wall a gum chewer watches cars pull forward cop stance fingers jam under his utility belt reflective shades asking everyone to roll down their windows waving one car through talking to the next asking for id chris pats his jackets his jacket pocket the license is good frida says he holds his hand over the wallet jeffrey she says, Chris, she watches the cop. He watches the cop. These people, their job, threatening his wife, threatening his son, willing to ruin his beautiful Chinese boy's life to grab him. Frida puts her hand over his. He turns sharply. She reaches into a pocket and takes out the wallet. He tries to stop her, but, he, but she finds it. Among the fake family photos is a snapshot he grabbed at the Korea town safe house dominic and charlene's arms chris at their side laughing every bit of it golden frida sticks the snapshot into her jeans pocket and hands the wallet back she says nothing chris wants to kick the door open and boot her out he grips the wheel instead two cars ahead are waved through the border cop shiny shades mr i am god beckons him forward one of, one of those I own you waves. Chris pulls up in the booth. The board guard with the gray buzz cut looks at a computer, then at the flyer post on the wall and out of the window at him, then back to the flyers. Sh Shiny Shades scans Chris's face and as he pulls up. Chris puts the window down, tries to look bored, feels wired. Frida starts crying. Where are you headed? Shade says. Mexicali, Chris says. Frida puts on a wad of Kleenex from her purse and cries into it. Actual tears. Shades leads down, looks at her and at Chris. Is everything all right? Her grandmother had a stroke. Everybody's worried. We're trying to get there before Frida looks at him, eyes wet. Sorry, officer, it's been a day. The older guard, buzz cut, comes out of the booth and walks toward them. Chris tense as fuck. She took the Beretta back at the at the safe house. Why did he let her do that? She's getting both of them. She's getting them both. Buzz cut waves at Shays. Offerman. Shays gives Chris a long look at his fatigue, his weakness, his vulnerability. Chris is unarmed. He can barely move. If he smashes the if he smashes open the driver's door, he can hit the, gra the gas, flatten shades, and be across the border before the guy gets back on his feet. Buzzcut marches up and with urgency says, come on. Shades looks at Chris and at Frida. Hope your grandma's all right. Pull forward. Then he follows Buzzcut to the car behind them. In line, Chris inches away, hands knotted, the sled chammer pain in his shoulder, nearly making him scream. He looks at the rearview mirror. The guards approach the car behind him from either side. Hands on their holstered weapon, Buzzcut tells the driver to lower his window. What's going on, Chris says. Keep driving. He pulls ahead, barely able to see through his pounding vision. Don't pass. It's my brother, Frida says. Who? In the car behind us. I called him from the payphone when he stopped. He looked like you. She turns. Enough. He wants to laugh. He checks the mirror again. The driver is out of the car, handing over his license. Tall, fit. He has short black hair and wears shades. The guards are now telling him to remove. Elisa. What? I mean, Frida. Nine, ten. She puts away the tissues. They skate through the Mexican checkpoint. They're in Mexicali. Palm trees. Cambios. Tourist hotels. The welcoming Chinese pagodas. Painted red, green, and gold outside the big sign. 
The Reeds, bienvenidos a Mexicali. Fuck no. It just has come back to around this place. It just has to come back around to this place, doesn't it? I'm not going backwards into that fire, into nothing. I'm not staying here, he says. There's nothing for me here. You're not. Calm down, Frida says. He keeps driving until he, she tells him, pull over. Dusty farmland slides toward the horizon. He stops on the dirt shoulder. She gets out and pops the trunk. He returns and hands him a black brick of a satellite phone. One minute, she says. Not one more second. Not a second more. She ambles forwards towards the field, hands her hands in her pockets, giving him privacy. She e He eases himself from the car and leans against the hood. Gripping the phone, he inhales and punches in the number. He hears static and an electric ping, and then finally, her voice. Hello. Distant. Tiny. Insubstantial. But there. She isn't under arrest. She hasn't run. Home. Baby, Chris says. Static. Nothing until a sound that might be Charlene exhaling hard you okay she says nowhere near close maybe never again but she knows that and she has and he has 45 seconds left only one thing counts right now how's dominant he says in my lap and asleep safe and sound his heart eases listen and believe what i'm saying someday somehow when i'm sad and secure we'll be together the static flares for endless seconds there's no reply at the edge of the field frida looks at her watch and walks toward him charlene chris says i hear you she says traffic rolls past a farm truck gasoline tanker chris nods and shuts his eyes he hears frida approach i don't know what happened he says don't explain i don't want to know what i'll take with me is that you'll pull it all on the line to warn me off is that you put it all on the line to warn me off Frida gestures for the phone stay strong he says to Charlene I love you Charlene's voice is ghostly you too a sound maybe a laugh or a sob always Frida takes the phone from him almost gently and presses end Chris sinks back into the driver's seat the sky seems to shimmer Frida returns the phone to the trunk and then he gets a lighter then she gets a lighter from the purse. She takes the snapshot of him with Dominic and Charlene, lights it on fire. She holds a photo for a second, the flaming, flaring red, eating it. She drops it and grinds it into the dust and gets back in the car. She slams the door. Drive. Where? His voice is hollow. Past the mountains, it'll be dark. A plane's coming. Where am I going? I don't know. All I, all I know is to get you to the plane, they said it's a very long flight. As he pulls into the highway, he looks back. Sunset rakes the, sun, the sky violet and orange. He puts down the window and, and an evening chill is sinking into the air. In the side of the mirror, he sees the other side of the border, the lights of California, shimmering like a mirage. Nothing is different five feet on this side of the line except everything. He's leaving the land of death driving into the land of death. Neil, brother, Charlene, Dominic. Somehow, someday I'll be back. He stares ahead at the desert plains, at the blue, brown mountains rising, hazy, the horizon. This is the land of blood and ghosts, of unfinished business. Breathe, he tells himself. Just fucking breathe. Wow, there it is. <laughs> that is um, part one of the novel Heat 2. And let's just give you a little... Uh, part two is going to be set in 1988. And it's going to be set in Las Vegas. Where Chris and Charlene meet. And then, uh, yeah, then there's, there's, then there's just all these different timelines that, that start. Vince and Hannah, when he's in, um, 
Vincent Hanna when he's in um, Chicago as well. And uh, it's I, I've read ahead and it's incredible. So what did you think, guys? What did you think? I, I, you know, Chris made it to Mexico. No doubt headed for a plane that's probably going to take him south, South America. And uh, yeah, that's yeah, a lot of pain right there. Look who's here. Multi-angle Polly. What's up, my man? Midnight in the house. Just breathe. Yeah, what a line. What a line. Thank you, deleted. Thank you so much. I believe. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let me check that. 10 people live. 30 likes. Thank you so much. We just, uh, that is, uh, that is all going to, going to be all it. We just read, uh, for two hours. That was great. I, what I will do is I will, um, chapter this. So you get right to it because in between, it's just me and you guys talking through to the chat, but why not get right to this, right? To each chapter that I've read, including the prologue, which was fantastic and the first part of this book so let me know in the comments guys let me know in the comments i want to know if you would like for us to continue and go to the read, read the the next 50 pages or whatever uh what did you think of this reading and uh you know maybe we can do it again in a couple weeks uh, I have definitely have other things uh, that we have to do in the channel, but um, I know you guys uh, were checking out our unboxing of, of Heat and uh, got a lot of big uh, responses from that. So I'm like, all right, let me let me do this, uh, you know, let me do this uh, this reading for you guys. Uh, what did you guys think? Deleted leaves a lot of possibilities story ways. Well, so yeah, so what we got here is. Um, Hannah in present time trying to find Chris and for the moment he's lost he, he made it right and then we're gonna go to 1988 where Chris meets Charlene in Vegas and they had kind of have this incredible one night stand but then he's got to get to Chicago to work with Neil on a job and you're going to get a lot of other insight that was alluded to and talked about in Heat, which is which is fantastic. If you watch it, watch that movie again. You, they drop all this, you know, info throughout the movie of Chicago and other jobs and other 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 people. Fire, yeah, fire, fire. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for being here. So, ah, uh, yeah, I think that's it, guys. It's been an incredible uh, uh, evening. It's my pleasure. I've never seen heat. So, okay. I would see it. I would see it now. That's all I could say. <laughs> uh, if you're a Michael Mann fan, a fan of his, fan of his movies, uh, heat does not disappoint. So, again... When we come back to do this, we have the Kindle. Very easy interface for me to read. I loved it. And uh, that's really it, guys. Let's see what you guys have to say, and then we're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. When I read novels, I try to read 10 pages at a time just to change what I read, read better. Yeah. I, you know, it really depends on the novel for me. You know, it depends on the novel for me. Um, sometimes I can just rip through something. Uh, this one uh, is, 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 an, is, a, is a quicker, easy read. Uh, what was the other latest book I read? You know, it depends. Yeah, it depends on it depends on the book because 
some 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 work is just more dense than others that's just the way it is you know um well yeah you know that that's it uh thank you stump brat god bless you ironically he the movie is a vid suggestion yeah i highly recommend it awesome yeah, let me see if there's any other LA things in there that I'm thinking about that it's all pretty on point. You know, um, John Voight's character Nate in the movie, you see him in his in his bar, the blue room. That was pretty cool. You know, the valley is so huge. So did it say San Fernando Valley? Yeah, San Fernando Valley. You know, San Fernando Valley is just not pretty. It's just not a pretty part of town. There are some pretty parts in it, but you know, it's, it is what it is, it's the valley. And you know, that's kind of the fun part too, because if you go to Cobra Kai, it's all over the valley, you know, it's Reseda and those are areas in between. So yeah, it's just flat in, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, okay. Uh, true, certain chapters uh, may go by certain novels. I go by chapter for chapter. Question. Well, yeah. And then reading this to you guys, I'm like, okay. I thought I was gonna get a little further, but I'm like, I'm good for tonight. All right, my friends. I think that's it. Um, what do we have going on next week? Paul Chato. Paul Chato is gonna come on next Wednesday afternoon. I have. I'm going to be working on a couple of, I've already recorded one video um, and it's pretty explosive. It, 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 you know, this, this, this blogger that I follow, he, he uh, really kind of just has his own, he's got some incredible insight and he's really funny. So I read this, uh, his latest blog. And uh, I, I think it's really interesting in regards to, uh, you know, certain uh, names that are called uh, that let that uh, in derogatory names that are called uh, that you call Latinos. Oh, it's really good. That video is recorded. I need to edit it. I want to clean it up. Um, then there's a video I want to do, guys, on Zoot Suit and kind of the unforgotten person that was actually killed in the early 40s um, that caused the Sleepy Lagoon murder case. It's an incredible article, an incredible insight. It's, it's sad, but I think by reading it and by doing a video on it, it's, it's, it's gonna shed some great light on that. So that's a video I'm working on. What I will not do on this channel, uh, no She-Hulk. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. Um, I'm going to watch it, though. I'm going to watch it tonight. What else am I covering? Oh. Hey, what's up, man? <laughs> hey, you really... <laughs> I'm not lying. Um, man, I think I think Zach's won the internet today. I think he won it, Tom. Yeah, I think he was on, like, 10 different channels today talking about the same thing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I kid. It's what I do, especially when I'm dressed up. Um, it's good to see you, my brother. I'm going to see you. I'm going to see She-Hulk. Okay. Um, there's a new comedy show called This Fool on Hulu. I'm going to do a season one breakdown of it. And uh, I want, I'm going to record it Saturday. I'll record it Saturday morning. It's going to give me between now and then some time to, I'm going to, I want to watch as much as I can the season again. Um, I absolutely think it's fucking hysterical. I, there's so many reasons why I love it. And I'm going to give you my reasons in that breakdown, but it's called this fool. If you want to check out the first couple episodes. So by the time you see the video, you'll, you'll have some, uh, some familiarity with, to it. Okay, um, yeah, and I think that's it, guys. I um, There's a lot of other stuff, a lot of other great stuff we're doing on the channel. And I thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, it's been a great two hours. And, you know, 
Uh, yeah, dude, you. <laughs> this boy, I woke up. What stream were you on early this morning? Was it pop culture? And then it was really funny because I just, when I was, you know, just going about my morning here at the house and getting the, uh, getting the, uh, getting my dogs and, you know, cause I'm, I'm solo this week, which is why I could do this right now. Let's just be honest. You know, or else will we be like, you know, go to bed. Um, I saw Zach's pop culture minefield, flaccid, Phoenix, salty Texas Sea. I mean, this motherfucker was like in in five different time zones at the same time. Uh. <laughs> Oh man, no, but you know, uh, we we got to do a we we have to do a uh, a uh, a stream. We got to do, do. I'd like to do it on the the movie Three Idiots, and the thing with the movie Three Idiots is that it's an Indian film, I believe, in the the, the late aughts, and then Mexico redid it about five years ago. So there is an Indian version of it and the Spanish one, uh, Spanish language. So we got we should watch both of those and do a compare and contrast. Um, I went live. Oh, that's right. That's right. She does love me, man. We're missing each other. So what's going on is uh, she is away uh, working. Um, and. Even though she's in the same city, she, she hasn't been here since Tuesday morning. Yeah, it, you know, it's just it, she, she'll be back Saturday. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, cool. You know, get to be by, get to be by myself. Ah, you know, after half a day, it's like, <laughs> where's my lady at? Um, uh, awesome. I try to be everywhere like Salty and Zach's. My reach is only as long as Conan's sword. Oh, oh. Yes, Paul, I love that idea. Let's do it, man. Let's do it, my brother. And yes, I I even... Uh, I even... Here, let, let, let's go for you guys tonight. I even... In... I even want my cuffs for you guys. I love these cuffs. I love this shirt. Yeah. Even with my cuffs, guys. There we go. That's a better shot. That's a better shot. So when they shake, so you, you, you grab them and you shoot them out. And that's how you show them. And I'll never forget... Let me see who in in the Sopranos, and I'm I'll tell this, and then that that that, then I I gotta close up. Where uh, Chris Moltisanti is being made, and he's getting all you know he's all dressed up, and he's with Polly Walnuts. Rest in peace um, to Polly Walnuts. And they get out, and Polly Walnuts is checking him out, and. You know, looking at him, make sure, and then he says, "Shoot your cuffs, kid." Shoots him, right? Shoots his cuffs like you can grab him. You shoot him out, so your cufflings can show, man. And I thought that was like what, you know, coming up on twenty years. I thought that was the coolest thing. So anytime I, I put my wear my cuffs, I think of Polly Walnuts. Yeah, man. Uh, Mags is hilarious. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't get that. Uh, Polly, don't be like Chris Gore at the strip clubs in Vegas. Oh, well, <laughs> did, did he, he, did he, did he stream from a strip club? Andale, andale. Well, I know he had a turn and burn. He was just doing a one night or so. Hey, hey, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, Brian, I haven't been to to a, a, a strip club in a long time, and that was when I was still drinking. So the, those days are those days are done. 
All right, my good people. Uh, I want to thank. Look at all the members that are hanging out here. You guys are fantastic. Um, I want to remind you guys. Oh, she was on Salty tonight. Oh, okay. Cool. I want to remind you guys that if you are a member of the channel, you do have a discount code to where if you go to um, our merchandise page, latinoslam.com, you get fun stuff like this. You can get like 10% off, but to get your code, I don't know if you have the code, if, if I've given you your, you'll know, right? Whether I emailed you or DM'd you your uh, discount code, um, get a hold of me if you haven't yet. And, and if you want to get something, you don't have to, right? You don't have to. I'm just saying that if you want to buy something on the latinoslant.com page, make sure you get a hold of me and I get you your discount code. So uh, I'm talking to you, Brian, Zax. I'm talking to Stump Brat. I'm talking to anyone, any members that, that, that listen to this right now. So um, yeah, that's it. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up. Much love to everyone. If you are a member of the channel, you will see your name in the closing credits. It's been fantastic. It's been a pleasure. I will see you soon. And wherever you're at, keep your slant muy fuerte. Paz. The wrong one. Paz. Keep your slant fuerte.